Well, good morning again. Happy Independence Day weekend. I'm excited. I have friends on up here with me today. I don't have to be up here all by myself. I have separation anxiety, so this is really good for me. <laughs> Since it's Independence Day weekend, I don't know how many of you know this. I have spent, I had spent uh, some time uh, in the Army, in the Army Reserve, and uh, I was a chaplain. I was a chaplain candidate, and then I was a, a chaplain for about three years. And during that time, uh, as I was getting ready to go to chaplain boot camp, which I just need to go ahead and be honest about something, chaplain boot camp is not, it's like an extreme summer camp, let's just be honest. <laughs> There's, it's, not, it's not that hard, but I didn't know that. And so I was really nervous about going. And so I had reached out, I think I reached out to the chief of chaplain's office and just said, hey, what should I expect? How should I be getting ready for this? And they had somebody call me. They had a, a, another chaplain candidate call me who had walked through the program recently and kind of answered all my questions. It kind of addressed the fact that I was scared to be yelled at and, and they're like, ah, they don't really yell at you again. You're a chaplain, they're not gonna yell at you. And, that's just bad for them, and they're afraid you'll pray against them and all this stuff, so they're not going to yell at you. <laughs> and so it, just, it was this really nice conversation that we had, uh, kind of uh, stilling some fears and concerns that I had. But I felt pressure. I felt pressure that I was going to let people down. I felt pressure that I was going to disappoint people. Uh, I felt pressure that I wasn't going to be a good soldier. Uh, I felt pressure that I was going to wash out. Uh, I just wasn't going to make it. Uh, I felt a lot of different kinds of pressure. And, and you know what's really disappointing? Is that I still feel pressure. Not that kind of pressure. But even as I've gotten older, I still feel that pressure. I feel pressure to be a good father, to be a good minister, to be a good employee, to be uh, a good husband. I feel pressure to be a good son. And I don't know how many of you feel pressure to do those same things as well. Maybe the other things that I'm not even aware of. You feel pressure. And probably many of us would love to have somebody pick up the phone and call us and put all of our fears at ease. To reach out and to give us a little bit of comfort. And so today, as we walk through the book of Hebrews, continuing our journey through the book of Hebrews, we're going to look at how Jesus is that comfort that we need. He's a better comfort. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 14. And we're going to go through chapter 5, verse 10. And I want us to talk about how Jesus is a better comforter for us. And he's a better comforter because he understands, he knows what we're going through. We're going to look at the three things that he knows. And the first thing that the scripture talks about is that he knows the power of temptation. He knows the power of of temptation. Look at verse 14. Since then we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We've entered the third portion of the book of Hebrews. And this portion goes all the way up through chapter 10, verse 18. And it's basically talking about how Jesus is better than the Levitical priesthood. He's better than the Levitical priesthood. Now the priesthood's job was to minister uh, in, the, in the temple of God at all times or the, the, the sanctuary of God at all times. Whether it was the tabernacle or the temple, that's what the priesthood's job was. So they all came from one tribe. They came from the Levites. And the high priest was descended from the person of Aaron, Moses' brother. And their job was to keep the sacrifices going, to keep the incense burning. But the primary job was to make sure that all of Israel knew how to engage in worship. They were in charge of passing down the ways in which we worship year after year after year. And once a year, one of these rituals was that the high priest would go into the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, and there he would, he would uh, be before the tabernacle, the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant, and he would offer a sacrifice. 
on behalf of the people. He'd go through a curtain and he'd be right there. And Jesus, in Hebrews, Jesus is being described as this newer and better high priest. And the way he describes him is he goes through these upgraded versions of what the high priest went through. So rather than a uh, a curtain, notice in verse 14, he passes through the heavens. Rather than going through a curtain, he goes through the heavens. And rather than going before the Ark of the Covenant and kind of this picture, what the book of Hebrews will later call a shadow of the things in heaven, Jesus goes after his uh, resurrection and ascension, he is right there before the throne of God. And he doesn't have to offer countless sacrifices. He offers one sacrifice once and for all himself. We learn later that he's not from the tribe of the Levites. He's from an older order of priests. His sacrifice was not for his own sin, but for our sin. He's a purer priest than the priest of the Levitical priesthood. But there is one way, one very specific way, in which Jesus is very much like the priest's of the Old Testament, he was tempted. He was tempted just like they are. And I hope you understand how comforting this is for us. It's a beautiful reality that whether Jesus could sin or not, and there's some debate there theologically, I believe Jesus couldn't sin. Jesus was tempted. Jesus was tempted. He felt the weight The pressure of doing what God did not want him to do. He felt the temptation, the pressure to chart his own path and not to walk the way of his father. He felt the pressure of taking something that wasn't his. He felt the pressure of disobeying. He grasps, understands this affinity that we have to do things the way that we want to do things. To disregard the desires of God. To chart our own course. To be our own master. He understands this pressure. And this is what it means when it says that he was tempted in every way. Notice it says in verse 15. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. Now if you think about this for a minute, you'll be like, I don't think Jesus was tempted in every way that we are. I mean, there were things, or there are things now that we have that Jesus did not have to deal with. Jesus was probably never tempted to embezzle from his company. They didn't have LLCs back in his day. There was no tax evasion like that. If he got $10 for making a table, he could spend it however he wanted to. Nobody was checking the books on him. Maybe Judas was, but that was just because he wanted to steal it. Jesus was never tempted by internet pornography. There was no internet, not even dial-up back then. But Jesus was tempted to lust. Jesus was tempted to steal. And I think the, way, the best way to think about it is I had a professor who talked about this. And he said the best way to understand Jesus was tempted in every way was to think about it as pressure. We've been reading, we've all been kind of riveted over the past few weeks about this submarine that, that had the, the, the five people on it that went to, to look at the Titanic. And, and something happened. The pressure got to the vehicle and it, and it imploded. And so the human being, a human, can go down about a thousand feet in the water before the pressure gets to them. And this doesn't mean like you get crushed. It means that your, the pressure is so great your chest cavity won't be able to rise and you won't be able to breathe even if you have a breathing apparatus. Some submarines can go even deeper than that. Some animals can live incredibly far under the water. Jesus is like this. If you think of temptation as pressure, then different kinds of temptation exert different kinds of pressure on us. There are some kinds of temptation that exert an enormous amount of pressure on you that don't on me doesn't bother me at all. On the other hand, there are things that I am tempted by that you're like, I don't see what the big deal is. But all of us have a breaking point. All of us have a point where the temptation gets too much and we give in to it. But Jesus went as far as one can go. If you think about a dial of pressure, Jesus went to 10 out of 10 pressure and still never caved in. He reached uh, beyond crush depth with temptation. And he held up under it. He was tempted as hard as somebody could be tempted, and it was tempted throughout his life. It wasn't just one chapter in the Gospels. That's what we think of. We think of, oh, Satan tempted him a little while and then left. No, 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 no. Jesus was tempted constantly, just like we are. 
There's a quote by C.S. Lewis that says, a silly idea is current, that good people do not know what temptation means. This is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. A man who gives in to temptation after five minutes simply does not know what it would have been like an hour later. That is why bad people, in one sense, know very little about badness. They have lived a sheltered life by always giving in. Jesus was the unsheltered one. He was the one who resisted in the wilds. He went to the extremes of temptation in ways that we'll never know anything about. And he was victorious. He won. It is wrong to say that Jesus succeeded where we failed. That is far too generous to us as a people. He succeeded where we have never been strong enough even to go. We haven't even made it that far. And this is why Jesus is so incredibly comforting for us. This is why you can turn to him during the most difficult, heartbreaking, struggle-inducing temptations in your life. It's because he gets it. He really understands. And we think that religious people typically do not understand. We think that the more holy, the more righteous the person is, the more they don't live in the real world. They don't understand what I'm going through. You think priests and pastors, you look at me and you're like, Travis, you don't know what I'm going through. You live this sheltered life. You work at church. You don't know how hard it is out there. And you might be right to some extent. But when you transfer this over to Jesus and you think Jesus is so much higher and holier, there's no way he can understand what it's like to go through. But this is a failure to understand what a high priest is. Jesus is a better high priest not just because he understands, uh, he's able to draw closer to God. That's not the only reason why he's a great high priest. He's a greater high priest because he understands even more than I do, than you do, the depths of temptation. He understands experientially how hard it is. He understands how weak we are. He gets it. He gets it more than any other human being has ever gotten. Jesus is more human than the most human person ever. This is why it was such a good idea to have another chaplain candidate call me. A drill sergeant didn't call me. That would have not been helpful. It would have been terrifying. Ironically, when I was actually a chaplain, I worked in a drill sergeant unit. So that, that was like fear. By, was, it, was it cure by exposure? Right? You just kind of perpetually were exposed to it. They didn't have the chief of chaplains call me. It wasn't another chaplain. They had a chaplain candidate who went through it just a short while before me. That's why it was comforting. He knew what I was facing. And Jesus knows what we're facing. He understands but is without sin. Because he understands without sin, he is able to save without condemnation. And this is exactly why we can draw close to him. And it tells us why in verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near. To draw near is to, uh, uh, it's like a priestly term. It's a priestly idea. We draw near to the throne of God. We pray to him. We go to him. And we do this confidently. You cannot approach the throne of grace without faith. We have to be confident that help will come. So when you are facing temptation, no matter how embarrassing it is, no matter how this is the thousandth or two thousandth or three thousandth time you've struggled with the same thing, no matter how many times you've wanted to get in, give in, no matter how many times you've maybe flirted with it way too much, no matter how many times you've fallen, you can go to him again, no matter how disgusting you find the temptation to be, you can go to Jesus. You can go to him. That is the confidence required to approach the throne of grace. That's the faith. And what do we find there? It tells us in verse 16. The throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace. Mercy is there to pick us up when we fail. Mercy is there to pull us back when we've gone too far along the path of temptation. Grace is the power source. Grace is what gives us the strength to resist. You can't white knuckle it through temptation in your life. You will inevitably fall. That is why we need grace. It is there to empower us. And lastly, it's given to us in our time of need. Many of us feel that grace is there, but it's not there when we need it. There's this great movie. I wouldn't say it's great. That's probably a generous term. It's a good movie. It's about a group of like wacky superheroes. And one of them's special ability is to turn invisible, but only when nobody is looking. It comes in handy in the movie at some point. 
But that's how we feel grace is. We're like, grace is there for me, except when I need it. Well, then why do we sing about a grace being amazing? That doesn't sound like a very amazing grace to me. It is there when we need it. We're able to get it in our time of need. And so Jesus is there for us. He is a comfort to us in the midst of our temptation if we will just draw near to him. But he is also a comfort for us because he knows the problem of our weakness. He knows the problem of our weakness. Look at verse 1 of chapter 5. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. This is the continuing of the discussion about the high priest. And what the author is saying here is that one of the major distinctives of the early priesthood, of the priesthood, is that he is beset by weakness. Now, this is not specifically talking about human frailty. It's not talking about how we get sick and how we get tired and we get worn out. It's talking about the the susceptibility that we have to temptation. We are weak. We are vulnerable to temptation. We're so vulnerable to temptation that we sin without even knowing it. Right? Have you ever been faced with a moral or ethical dilemma? And you made a choice and you to this day are not sure whether or not you did the right thing. Are you ever in a position where you maybe sinned out of ignorance? You didn't know that you did the wrong thing. Maybe you're in a in another state and you were you were driving in a certain way and you didn't realize, "Oh, I can't I can't talk on the phone." Or I didn't know that I couldn't do this in this state. You sinned out of ignorance. Sinning out of ignorance is something that is baked into the Old Covenant, addressing the Old Covenant. Those those, uh, sacrifices that the high priest offered every year were sacrifices in the case of intentional sin or unintentional sin. They were for accidental sins. And so the priest offered it on behalf of himself and behalf of the people. The high priest's job was to make this sacrifice because even when we as a people do something right, we sometimes do something that's wrong, unintentionally. Might be trying to help and we wind up hurting. But Jesus is a better high priest because while he does identify with the weakness, he does not have the same weakness himself. And so he overcomes two problems within the priesthood that are talked about in verses 5 and 6. And the first one is corruption. Look at verse 5. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Verse 5 talks about how Jesus did not make himself a high priest. Instead, he was chosen. He was picked because he's God's son. You see, in the Old Testament, God was the one who appointed Aaron. And it was supposed to be Aaron's descendants. But by the time we get to the writing of Hebrews, if the temple hasn't already been destroyed, depending on when you date the book of Hebrews, the high priest was no longer chosen by God. It was a political appointment given by Herod or by Rome or by Pontius Pilate. No longer was it chosen by God. Corruption had seeped in. And it seems like corruption was always kind of there. The high priest regularly does things that he shouldn't do. The highest, most important institution that we have on earth was someone interceding on behalf of the people. Wouldn't you want the best candidate? Wouldn't you want the most holy person? Wouldn't you want the person who's wisest or who understands? But it becomes corrupted. It's a pawn, a tool for impression and injustice. And this shows us that even in our other institutions, they're open, they're liable to corruption. The problem with our institutions is that all of our institutions are made by us. Either we start them or we work in them. And so they're vulnerable to corruption because we're vulnerable to corruption. We're weak. We sin even when we don't mean to sin. And so everything, whether it's well-intentioned or not, is susceptible to that corruption. Our marriages, our families, our country, our church... All of it is susceptible to that corruption. 
And unfortunately, it's not just corruption, it's also instability. Look at verse 6. As he says, also in another place, you are priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is from an older order of priests. He's from a, 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 a line called the order of Melchizedek. This is just a fascinating story. Melchizedek was a guy who just randomly shows up in the book of Genesis. Abraham wins this battle over uh, some kings in Genesis. And then he offers 10% of his spoil award to this guy named Melchizedek, who comes from a place called Salem. He was a priest and a king. Melchizedek literally means in Hebrews, or in Hebrew, uh, king of righteousness. And he's this priest out of Salem. And then Melchizedek just leaves. And the author of Hebrews takes a moment to explain this to us. He says in verse uh, 1 of chapter 7, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. So what the author is doing here is keying in on this idea that Melchizedek shows up. And they don't say Melchizedek, son of somebody else. And they don't give a time of death. He just shows up and then he disappears. He's like this legendary immortal priest king. And the author of Hebrews says this is what our king is like. You see, whenever a priest dies, whenever someone in a position of power dies, we have this nasty problem of having to replace them. And sometimes that replacement is better, but oftentimes that replacement is not. How many of you sweat over having to replace longtime employees? You've got to train them. You've got to teach them. You've got to let them make the same mistakes that the last person made. Instability is inherent. In our fragility, infertility is, or, or sorry, instability is also fertile ground for temptation and sin. And these two things Jesus knows about, corruption and instability, because he was a victim of it. He was a victim of the corrupt priesthood. They were the ones that crucified him. He was a victim of instability because Pilate signed off on it because he feared the instability that would come if he said no to the Jewish priesthood. And it's in times when we face corruption and instability that we need comfort. Because it's in those times that our weakness, our our tendency to give in to sin will become most heightened. Because what we'll want to do is we'll want to choose the path of easy. We want to choose the path of least resistance. Because we don't want to have to struggle with pain and difficulty. We want that comfort. We want easy. And so often our character will buckle and will give in because we're weak. And Jesus understands that weakness. He understands it and you can turn to him. You can depend on him because he understands. And one day instability and corruption will no longer exist because Jesus has overthrown it in a new heaven and a new earth. And so we need not let our own weakness trip us up. We can find comfort in Christ, but we need to know that in finding that comfort, there's a price. And Jesus knows this price. He knows the price of obedience. Look at verse 7. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. We often think of Jesus' obedience as him going to the cross and dying, and that's true. But it is an incomplete truth. Notice it says in the first part of the verse, verse 7, in the days of his flesh. This is talking about his entire incarnate life. Jesus was subject to pain, to suffering, his entire, just like we are. Jesus scraped his knee. Jesus hit his thumb with a hammer. Jesus woke up some mornings and he was like, why does my neck hurt so bad? I got a good night's sleep. And his body was like, yeah, but you did it wrong. And so you're going to hurt for, for three days with a crick in your neck. Jesus suffered in those ways. He suffers just like we do. His whole incarnate life. But he understands. Now notice it says that he learned obedience. Now this can trip some of us up. 
And say, oh, was Jesus not obedient? Then you learned how to be obedient. That's not what it's talking about. Think about learning as like an experiential thing. Jesus was obedient, always obedient. But he learned how to be obedient in the context of being a human that struggles with temptation and weakness. So one of the big hindrances in my chaplaincy was that I was not what was called prior service. So rather than being an enlisted soldier first and then going to the chaplaincy, I went as a direct commission. I was, I was a chaplain just straight out of the gate. And this was a problem. A lot of soldiers thought I didn't understand. And so it was a hurdle to understand, to overcome. So I wound up having to do a lot of things that other chaplains weren't doing to show that I would gain the experience. I did ruck marches with them and all sorts of stuff to show them that I cared, to show them that I wanted to experience what they experienced. And this is what Jesus does for us. He was learning how to be human in the context of experience. And this is what is meant by the days of his flesh. Flesh is a, is a term that's usually linked with weakness. Jesus suffered with weakness. He has weak flesh, not that he gives in to temptation, but a weak flesh just that he bruised his knee and scraped his, scraped his elbows. People got on his nerves. He palled around with the same 12 bros for three years. I cannot imagine that they didn't drive him nuts at some point. I imagine that's why he sent them out to be apostles at one point. He's like, y'all just go. Just go. It's the same reason why we send our kids out to play. We're like, just go outside. Just go. The price that he paid, though, does culminate with him on the cross to die for us. As it talks about in verses 9 and 10, and being made perfect, he became a source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is what you have to understand, that Jesus is a comfort for us because he knows not just how hard it is to be tempted and how hard it is to be this weak fleshed person. He knows how high the cost is to obey. He knows, he's the only one that succeeded in light of all these factors, so he knows. And this is why we have to go to him. This is why he has to be our comfort and our hope and our peace. Because every single one of us have failed. Every single one of us have given in to temptation. Every single one of us have been weak. Every single one of us have tried to be obedient and fallen short. Not been what we hoped we would be. We need Jesus. We need a Savior. And if you don't believe me, if you don't, that doesn't convince you. Let me ask you this question. Are you tired? We talked about this last week. Do you ever feel the need for comfort? Do you ever wish that someone would help carry your burdens? That somebody would pick up the phone and tell you that everything is going to be okay? And somebody that's been there before. Do you wish that you could go back and change one thing in your life? Something that you regret? Do you wish that you could change something maybe that was done to you? Do you wish that you could not have said that one thing at that one time? You need a friend. You need Jesus. If you've answered yes to any of those questions, you need a savior because inherent in being our savior, Jesus also becomes our comforter, but he cannot be your comforter without also being your savior. And this is because he knows the price of obedience. He knows how stinking hard it is to be human. You would think that after all the years of human progress that we have, We've made climate controlled vehicles so we can drive in 100 plus degree heat and sweat very little. We have made uh, 1,000 thread count sheets to sleep in and they are amazing. <laughs> we have cotton and linen clothing. We have air conditioning units. You could tell that this sermon was written in July. <laughs> you would think that we don't need more comfort. In fact, we are like craftsmen of comfort. If you want to, I wonder if thousands of years from now, when people look at our society as archaeologists, they're like, the great contribution that American society had to humanity was comfort. We are geniuses when it comes to finding ways to be comforted. So why in the world can we not satisfy? Why can we not finally be comfortable? Why is there still something deep inside of me? that is uncomfortable, that is, has experiences discomfort. It's because we need our Savior. We need a comfort that no amount of air conditioning, padded seats, nice clothes are ever going to satisfy. And it's our Savior. It's our Creator. It's our Lord Jesus. It's our Comforter. So how do you gain this comfort? It tells us in verse 7, In the days of his flesh, 
Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. We offer prayers and supplications. Death is not a comfort. Death was not supposed to be. Death is the fate of those who cannot be obedient. And guess what? None of us are obedient. So we have to go to God in prayer. We have to cry out to him. We must pray and pray ardently to the Lord. We have to be a people of prayer. And if you're not a believer, there's a very simple prayer that you can offer. And it's one that goes something like this. Lord, I have sought comfort in everything besides you. My body is weak and I am prone to give in to things just to feel comfortable. But I believe that by your death, you are the ultimate comforter. And I know that by your resurrection, I can have access to that comfort as well. Would you give me your comfort? Would you be my comforter today? And if you're a believer, the process doesn't look very much different. We have to go to God and confess when we fail, when we struggle with temptation. We have to go to God when we're at the end of our wits, when we're right on the edge of giving in to that weakness. Y'all, we lack comfort because we do not ask for it. That is the plain and simple truth. We lack comfort because we do not ask. But here's something else I would suggest, and I'll close with this. He mentions loud cries and supplications. Jesus did not keep his need for comfort quiet. In our country, in our civilization, we idolize people who suffer through without saying anything. Jesus was not silent on the cross. He cried out. He was not silent in the garden. He cried out. Are you silent in your suffering? We need other believers to go through with us our suffering and our challenges. We need brothers and sisters in Christ to walk alongside of us can't do it alone. And maybe the way that Christ wants to answer your prayer for comfort is to give you other believers. We need to be in groups and connect groups. We need to be in small groups together. We need to find a Bible study. We need to be with other people, other believers. And I know that many of us today are struggling. We're suffering. You're hurting. Maybe you're going through some emotional pain, some spiritual pain. And Jesus gives us reminders. He gives us reminders. That's why we're about to take the Lord's Supper. The bread and the cup. It says, this is my body, this is my blood, and the days of his flesh. This is his flesh. We're about to consume it in a metaphorical sense. To remind ourselves of our great comforter. And the one who comforts us in the midst of our weakness and temptation. But before we do that, for those of you who are hurting... Those of you who are struggling, those of you who need comfort, I'm going to ask you to do something very brave. I'm going to ask you to stand up. If you would like someone to pray for you, if you'd like me to pray for you, because you are hurting, because you need comfort today, you're welcome to stand up. I I need it. I'm only standing already. If you can't stand, you can lift up a hand, and I'm going to pray for you, and then we're going to enter into a time of taking the Lord's Supper together. The Lord's Supper is here. It's here for those baptized believers who have put their faith in Jesus Christ so that we can remember what he has done for us and that he is our comfort. So again, if you'd like for me to pray for you specifically, you're welcome to stand up. You can put up a hand and I'm going to pray and then we'll take the Lord's Supper together. Father God, as we approach your table, Lord Jesus, we know that you have given us reminders because we so need it, we forget that you are our comfort, that you are our peace. So Lord God, I pray that you would bless this time as we come to the table. Lord, I pray for those who are standing, who can't stand, maybe who want to stand but just didn't feel that they should do that. Lord, I pray that you would give each of them peace and comfort, Lord. It is so hard to be human. It's so difficult to be a person. And Lord, that seems strange to say, but to not say it is to deny what you've said in your word. You're acquainted with weakness. You're acquainted with temptation. And so to say that I am not weak is to say that I'm stronger than you. And so God, I pray that in your grace, you would be here for those that are struggling today. I pray that you would comfort and encourage them, that you would build them up. And I pray that by your power, some measure of grace would be offered today. As we take the bread and the cup, that be given to strengthen them and empower them for their good and for your glory. 
it's in your son's name we pray.